I think the hardest thing in the entire world is to see your child in pain or have a diagnosis that doesn't go away. And being a parent that um, can't see, you can't change the reality except love your child. Right. You can listen to your child and, and provide the tools. Yeah, but I think that it's really important as parents that parents don't show the vulnerability to the child because they need to see the parent as the rock and as their strength mm -hmm. because they don't know what to think. And of course, it's age dependent, right? It's a, it definitely is age dependent. Yeah. But I have a question because this is something that I hear a lot in the support groups. Certainly a parent's the parent and has to take control and is, you know, responsible for getting the right help. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's okay, I believe, to show that you're hurting too. Yes. Because you can share the experience and I think it validates it for the child as long as it's done, you know, obviously with care in the right way. You can't be falling apart every second. So I think that um, depending on, once again, the, the personality traits of the child, some children take on the role of being a parentified child. What does that mean? So a parentified child is someone that sees that their parent is hurting yes. and all of a sudden doesn't want to show their feelings because they see the, the fragility or the vulnerability of their parent and they want to show their parents that they're okay even though they're not okay. So yes, I agree, it's a, it's a balance. It's a very important balance to be able to strike between sharing your feelings and allowing yourself to be vulnerable with your child. And be real. Yeah. And be real, but also to show them that you're there to pick them up. How can a parent best support their child? Because it's, like you said, it's a very confusing fine line. So I think that when you're first diagnosed, I believe that being like psychoeducationally, uh, a sound psychoeducational background is really important. So you gather information, you, you figure out what is real versus what is not real, right? Give me an example. Um, not okay. going to diet, right? The most important thing is you don't want your kid to start Googling. So if there is a resource and your child is old enough to want to understand without, because they're going to get angry at you, right? You're going to have to be able to hold their anger. So it's okay for family, for parents, to get um, to show their vulnerability, but they also have to expect that their child is going to experience a tremendous amount of anger. Once again, depending on the age, right? If it's a toddler, there's not gonna be anger. Exactly. But, so you wanna say, okay, this is a resource. This is where you can look and find out the information, right? You're not the only one that can give them that information. Exactly, and I think as, as uh, children get older, they mm -hmm. need their peers. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm a big advocate of the summer camps for type 1 children because everyone's the same. Right. And they come up with a great structure mm -hmm. and they really naturally begin to experience the trials and errors of type 1. And they can talk to other kids and it becomes so normal for them. Absolutely. We really felt that, that we wanted her to get that experience. Mm -hmm. And when she came back from camp, it was um, almost about a year after she was diagnosed. She was 10 years old. She came back very empowered, and she made a lot of great friends that are probably her best best friends, her lifelong friends. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, there's this commonality that joins mm -hmm. them together, so that's amazing. I think that's super important. So how can you get your child to open up to you? Well, I mean, you, there are stages, right? I mean, it's a lot of... Um, a lot of people and there's controversy with the stages of death and dying. Exactly, that's right? a really good point. There must be so sort of natural progression of acceptance. Yes, so it starts with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She really coined the term, or she had the stages of death or grief or loss, right? So first it's denial, mm -hmm. and then it's anger, and then it's bargaining. Bargaining, I yep, that, you know, breaking up with God or I can do this for exactly, you. Exactly, yep. exactly. And then mm -hmm. there's depression, right? Like you go into a depression, which could be you getting into bed. Yep. And then there's the acceptance, right? But there's no timeline. There's no timeline of, oh, okay, you're going to be in denial. Some families could be in denial for a week or two and then say, okay, let's go. We go this is it. This is how we're going to move past this. Or some people could be in denial for a year, right? There's not one particular mold that you can fit into. 
One thing I'd like to share that some parents have done in the support groups, um, they maybe didn't really feel they had an ability to communicate well because their child was moody. Right. Uh, or they wanted to close the door and be left alone. They would leave um, a journal note sometimes mm -hmm. under their pillow. I think that's great. Or they would give a text, mm -hmm. I love you, I'm here for you, how are you doing? I think that's great. Uh, you know, giving a constant lifeline. Mm -hmm. What can I do? Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust that you can come to me if you need me. But I also trust that you got this. I mean, maybe not in the beginning, but I feel like giving them power that they know what they need for their body. Well, let me ask you a question. How long did it take Sophia to get this? Took her. Um, How old is she now? Sophia is 15. She gets it. And I would say that she's, she's probably started to really own it a, a lot after she came back from camp. Um, so when she was 11 or 10? Uh, uh, probably about 10 and a half, actually. But that's unusual. Uh, Tom and I, even to this day, are always um, looking at our apps. We have a CGM, which monitors her blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a great piece. I would say probably she's 15, probably 14 and 15. She's become 90% uh, self-sufficient with our guidance. And really along the way, we learned um, what was helpful for her. We believe in a lot of family protocols. Um, in terms of when this happens, let's do this. We have certain things where often, you know, she doesn't want to be bothered by me. You know, she's playing sports. She doesn't want her mother on the sideline bothering her. So it's, it's a real challenging thing because, you know, if they're going low, it can be life or death. So what do you do? We work out a signal. Perfect. Perfect. We have a signal and she knows, she knows. I will let her do it her way. What's the signal? Well, I we have ability to, to text her. But what if she's on the sports field? Then we, have, we can talk to her coach. And she knows if I stand up on the sideline, she knows. Perfect. Okay, without interrupting and drawing attention. But here's where I draw the line. She knows that if her life is at stake or, you know, it's a real medical concern, what I mean by she's going below 60, this is a medical emergency in my mind. So, well, and if she, mind, it's not your mind though. It's that's reality. It's reality. That's Below reality. 70, you start to get concerned. You get around 60, 50, it's not good. We have protocols. And if she's not responding and decides to ignore me, then I'm going to make a scene. That's the agreement. I we, think that's, we, we talk sense. it out. I don't care if she gets angry with me and she has gotten angry with me, but her, her health comes first. And uh, we're excellent, I believe, in communicating. And I don't know everything. I want her to tell me what works for her, what she wants me to do, knowing mm -hmm. that I have her back, knowing that I will make sure she's healthy. Mm -hmm.